this one of the true Kansas treasures. It's the Orphan Train Museum. How many of you have ever visited the Orphan Train Museum in Concordia? Oh, you have a real treat waiting for you. I also visited there this summer and learned more about the fascinating story of how orphan children from, New, from the New York City area found new families and homes, the majority in the heartland of our country. Between 1850 and, 18, and 1929, over 250,000 children were placed in homes. We found our visit to actually be very inspirational as the values which made our country great were stated in a covenant that had to be signed by each family that took one of these children. Among those items in the covenant was a requirement that the child would be taken to church and Sunday school every week. We kind of marveled at how that would be so much different today in placing children in homes. But consider this situation, which represents what many of the children experienced. You're an orphan child wandering the streets of New York City. Your parents have died, are dead. They died soon after they arrived, the family arrived in America. You don't speak English, and you've been left alone on the streets to fend for yourself. The year is 1850, and no one seems to care about you and the thousands of other abandoned children on the streets of New York. But the situation horrified a young minister by the name of Charles Loring Brace. And Reverend Brace suggested a bold solution to the problem. He established short-term orphanages for these children but then proposed to send those orphans on trains heading into the heartland of the United States. Advertising ahead of time in those places that the train was to stop that anyone who wanted a son or a daughter could, could come and uh, find one when the trains stopped. This solution began over 75 years of orphan trains. And many, though not all of these children were uh, adopted formally by, the, uh, by their families. And from such open families and homes came two governors, 20 United States congressmen, and one Supreme Court justice. In the state of Iowa, it's estimated that one out of four residents today are related to the orphan train children. In your imagination, place yourself in the place of one of these children, one of these orphans, as the train comes to a stop in the town of McPherson. A childless, the wealthy, middle-aged couple picks you out of the group, gathers your meager belongings, and leads you to a waiting automobile. After a short drive, you arrive at a large farmhouse and are shown to your very own room. You're blown away by the obvious wealth and luxury on display, but even more importantly, you're blown away by the love in the eyes of this couple. Later, after the best meal you've ever had, the couple announces their plans to not only give you a home, but if you're open to the idea, they want to formally adopt you and make you the heir of all that they own. You've been blessed beyond your wildest dreams, not because you earned it, but simply because of the love and generosity of your new parents. You know, that's not unlike the story we find in the book of Ephesians. On the adopted orphans represents you and represents me. And the family into which we've been adopted is the family of God. 
And God is giving us this letter, the letter of Ephesians, as a statement of who we have now become. And of the incredible riches that we now possess as a member of God's family. We also learn that we have a new role in life with new responsibilities. And this letter gives us guidelines on how to conduct ourselves as part of our new family, which is called the church. Ephesians 1.5 states, He predestined us to adoption as sons to Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. The book of Ephesians is written to encourage us to partake of these resources God has given us and, and to understand the family privileges that he has given us that come from our new position of being adopted into his family. This letter is brimming over with encouragement and enthusiasm and it's also intensely practical. And I think at this time in the history of what we are going through in our, in our country now, a time when we could be very discouraged, a time when we could be very uh, worried about how things are going to turn out in the future, we need to be grounded once again to know who we really are in Christ, what we've been given, the power that we've been given to live above the circumstances in which we find ourselves. So if you turn to the New Testament book of Ephesians, follow along, I want to read the first six verses of chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us to adoption, as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed upon us in the beloved. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter while he was a prisoner in Rome, one of the prison epistles. He had a special affection for this, uh, this church and these believers as he had spent more time and energy in the town of Ephesus than almost anywhere else. Paul spent at least three years ministering in Ephesus to these people. The pastoral mantle of leadership after Paul had passed to Timothy, and then later on to the apostle John. When John wrote the book of Revelation, he had been exiled from the town of Ephesus to the Isle of Patmos. Unlike many other letters in the New Testament that Paul wrote, Paul doesn't handle particular problems in this church. This letter has, uh, has been called a circular letter. It was a letter that was passed around because there were many churches in that particular area uh, in one of the other books, he refers to the letter to the Laodiceans, and this is probably the same letter that was written to the Ephesian church. It was meant to be circulated further abroad. Ephesus was a very prominent town. The main east-west trade route that ended up in Rome and went further east ran right through Ephesus, and because of that, the city is very prosperous. There was considerable wealth in that city. The city, when Paul was there, had already stood for hundreds of years, and when Paul was there, it boasted wide, marble-paved streets bordered by stately buildings of stone. It was a very imposing city, but the greatest attraction and the focus of 
of great civic pride was a magnificent temple to Artemis, or as the Romans knew her, Diana. This temple was four, size, four times the size of the Roman, of uh, the Parthenon in Athens. It was known as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And travelers and pilgrims from all over the Roman Empire would come to worship at this temple. It was a very cosmopolitan city. Lots of people passing through, so it was a wonderful place for them to hear the gospel, to come to know Christ, and then to take that as they went back to their homes. And that's exactly what happened. Acts 19.10 says that as a result of Paul's daily teaching, all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Gentiles. All the people in the province of Asia. So it was, Paul had, had with a very strategic plan of locating and spending time in Ephesus so the gospel could go out to the surrounding area. After being absent for several years from Ephesus and from the church that he established there, Paul wrote this letter of great encouragement. And this is the epistle to which we turn our attention. Now I realize that Mike did some sermons from the book of Ephesians, from the, uh, from the fourth chapter, I believe. And when we get to that point, we will not spend a lot of time there, as he's already covered those, those things. But there's so much in this book. I had one friend that said, you know, the Bible is a mountain, but at the very top is the book of Ephesians. That was his opinion of that, and I kind of share it with him. But let's look at the structure, and that'll help us to kind of get an overview of where we're going in the book of Ephesians. It could easily be divided into two sections, each of three chapters long, six chapters in length, each of two sections. The, last, the first three chapters tell us who we are in Christ, and the second, how we're to live in light of who we are in Christ, a very simple type of structure. Another way to look at the letter is through three words, wealth, walk, and work there. If you like all your words to begin with the same letter, the first three chapters talk about our wealth in Christ. The second, chapters four and five, and the first part of six tell us of our walk as a child of God, and then from six in on, we're told, we're talking, about, we're talking about the warfare that we face each day and how to stand firm in the strength of the Lord. In the period before the Japanese occupation of China in the 1930s, a Chinese Christian known to the Western world as Watchman Nee wrote a book on the book of Ephesians and taught on that book. And his teaching has been gathered into a short but a classic commentary on the book of Ephesians with the uh, title, Sit, Walk, Stand. It's a profound little book that I would recommend that corresponds to the wealth, walk, and welfare. And he observes that we sit secure in our family relationship with God. Chapter two, verse six, God raised us up with him seated us with him in the heavenly places. That's our position in Christ. We sit secure. The second is walk. And the walk tells us how we are to uh, live in the world, and the letter challenges us to display in our Christian lives conduct, which in keeping with our high calling. We've been called to sit with Christ in the heavenlies, and because of that, how do we live? We live above things. Someone said uh, uh, we need to be keep, uh, instead of keep looking up, in this particular saying, says we need to be looking down from where we are in heaven, and look down on the things, kind of as a bird would look down on uh, uh, a panorama type of view. The third well, it occurs to me first, before we get into that third, it, it occurs to me that this order of how uh, 
God gives us foundational truth first, and then he establishes standards of how we're to, to walk. This is how God works. He, he explains himself clearly, and then tells us how to live in light of that truth. God reveals himself first, and then he asks us to believe. We're not asked to meet impossible standards, but rather we're given the resources first and then encouraged to live in God's power. God saves us first by his grace. He adopts us into his family. He empowers us with his indwelling Holy Spirit. And then he says, in light of those things, this is how you are to live. Back to Watchman Nee's outline of sit, walk, and stand, the third section, beginning in the middle of the sixth chapter, we find the key to our attitude toward Satan and spiritual warfare with the word stand. Was expressed our place and attitude of victory over Satan. The final victory over Satan is assured, but until then, we're to stand firm because we are clad in the armor and protected by the armor of God. Ephesians 6.13 Therefore take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. <clears throat> the book of Ephesians has been compared to the book of Joshua in the Old Testament. God gave the Israelites the land. It was theirs by promise. They were there at the, at the edge of the land. They only needed to go in and possess it. The land was theirs by promise, but they had to move ahead in faith to possess what God had given them. Joshua 1.3, Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I've given it to you. Just as I spoke to Moses. God gave it, but the Jews had to go in and take it. And possess it. And likewise, in the book of Ephesians, we learn that God has redeemed us. And now, through the battles of, with our enemies, we're to move ahead by faith to possess those abundant blessings that are ours because we have been adopted into His family. And like the success that Joshua found in battle, we can enjoy success in living as we utilize the resources God has given us those abundant resources that he has provided for us that he tells us about in the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians. Paul's intention is to strongly emphasize that God has much more in mind for us than simply to get to heaven. God intends for us to live an abundant life right now. Some of Jesus' most precious words of promise are recorded in John 10.10 10, when he says, The thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came that you might have life and might have it abundantly. And through the finished work of Christ, we've been given eternal life. But we've been promised an abundant life. As eternal life comes through the finished work of Christ, the abundant life comes from the present work of Christ in our lives. And as we are committed to him, as we follow him, as we yield to his leadership, then we can experience the abundant life that Christ has for us. And in the routine of daily living, we can enjoy this overflowing life, experiencing the riches of the indwelling presence of God. As chapter 1, verse 3, we read a moment ago, said, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, and that's where we're sitting, positionally with Christ. And this abundant life is your birthright. This abundant life is your birthright. We have only to possess it. This life which is full and rich and meaningful and victorious. Now, note that this abundant life doesn't mean an easy or a comfortable life. It's a blessed life as God chooses to give it to us. 
The abundant, overflowing, satisfying life is a goal which the great apostle had in writing this letter to believers. And realize that this was written in a time when there was persecution, there was great opposition to the gospel. But the abundant life is available no matter what the circumstances around us. I'm interested in experiencing that abundant life as it grows more full. And I hope you will too. To whet our appetite for the series, I want to just point out a few of the major themes in this book. It becomes very evident as we study this epistle that a main theme is found in the words, in Christ. This term or equivalent terms like in him are found over 90 times in this book. 90 different times, in different ways, the Holy Spirit is saying this abundant life, this provision is found in him, in Christ. And because we believers are in Christ, we're to sit and rest in those truths. Another of the mighty things is the truth of God choosing us to be part of his family before the foundation of the world. Verse 4 tells us that. And before, and because God calls us solely on the basis of his grace, his mercy, and his love, we're totally secure in his love. Totally secure within the family of God. To return to the illustration of adoption, God chose us even before we boarded the train. It was not because we earned his love or deserved his mercy, but simply because of God's undeserved favor, because of his grace. He's called us. We've done absolutely nothing, nothing to deserve God's grace. We don't earn it in any way. Ephesians 5, or Ephesians, not Ephesians, Isaiah 53, 6 says that we all, like sheep, all of us, have gone astray. Romans 3, 23 says that every one of us has sinned and we all fall short of God's glory and God's standards. Every one of us has rebelled and the just punishment that we deserve is death. But out of all humanity, God chose us and he sent Jesus to bear the penalty of that death. And because Jesus died, we don't have to. Talking of spiritual death, the second death, the eternal death. And God chose you and he chose me and last eternally we'll be asking the question why why God and all the only answer is because I love you it wasn't because we're better than anybody else or more we're deserving than anybody else simply because of grace for by grace you've been saved through faith and that's not of yourselves it's a gift of God and so that no one could boast not as a result of works, but in what you boast. So in addition to the themes of being in Christ and being chosen, we also note a theme of unity with Christ through the church. At our spiritual birth, we become a member of the universal church of all believers. This is the body of Christ of which Jesus is the head. The universal church of all believers is a place in which each believer finds his identity and his ministry. And it's through the local church, as we are gathered here, that we exercise our special enablements called spiritual gifts. It's through the local church that we relate to one another. It's through the local church that we meet one another's needs, physical and emotional. And we have our needs met. 
within the larger body of Christ, there exists a unity which transcends all cultural, racial, and political boundaries. Perhaps you've had the opportunity to travel in other countries and be part of fellowship with other believers. And it's amazing the, the unity you feel, even though people were, were very different. And many times people have, have we, we are able to, to relate to people that have come from other countries to our country, and we find that they're just like us. They know the Lord Jesus just like we do, and that is the focus of their lives, just as it is of our lives. There's a great unity within the body of Christ. And it's such, you know, and, and much is made in this letter of the unity between probably the two most, most separated groups, the Jews and the Gentiles. And if God can bring those two together, he can bring anyone together. And he has in the body of Christ. There's no boundary which exists between people which can't be overcome through Christ. Another exciting theme, and this is one that I, that I, that I love to, to think about and to pray about, is that it is through we believers that God is going to display his grace and glory to all eternity. We're talking about eternity. We're talking about how we are heirs of Christ, of how we are joint heirs with Christ. Chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved, raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places. In Christ Jesus, now listen, in order that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. The riches of his grace are ours for all eternity. And we are displays, we are trophies of his love for all eternity. And we will be objects of God's perfect love throughout eternity. As we said also, this book is extremely practical for the here and now with details, instructions on how to live a consistent Christian life. In Ephesians, we find the foundational truth regarding the filling of the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 5.18, we learn how to conduct ourselves as husbands and wives, as children, as parents. Instructions on, get, on how to relate to employers, as employers or as employees. And as we've already mentioned, this section it instructs us how to defeat Satan as he attacks us with his fiery darts. My purpose this morning is to whet our appetites. For what's to come in our study of Ephesians? To give you an overview of what to expect. And I truly expect that our faith is going to be strengthened as we remember, as we're reminded, and as we learn again. Who we are in Christ. What are the resources God's given us? What are the benefits that God has given each one of us in Christ? A story is told of a man who lived in Montana. A search had long been made for this particular man because some years before a British nobleman had died a very wealthy British nobleman. He left a vast estate, and he had no children, so the estate was to be passed on to his nearest relative. This man in Montana was his nearest aide. For years they searched for him, but when he was finally located, this man was living in near poverty. I think he was a had a herd of sheep, but he was his nearest heir. He was just ecking out of a struggling existence, just barely surviving. And he was informed of his good fortune, which had been his for years, but outside of his knowledge. So what did he do when he learned of the truth? 
and he was the heir to this vast estate. Did he say, well, you know, that's kind of a good thing that I've got something to fall back on and I, I might go look into that someday. someday. No, that's not what he did. <laughs> on the basis and the strength of the knowledge that he had been given, he went to town, bought himself a new suit, bought a ticket to England, and left. Someone asked him where he was going, and he said, I'm taking, I'm going to take position, possession of my estate. You know, you and I are far, far richer than any inheritance we could get here on earth. We are richer. But do we possess it? Do we understand what we've been given? And do we live in light of that? Do we live as, as sons and daughters of the king of the universe? Because that's who we are. And that's what we learn about in the book of Ephesians. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for the challenge that you give us in your word. Father, we thank you for the vast riches that you have, have given us by virtue of being in your family. We thank you for the adoption that you have, you have set in motion, that we are your children, we are in your family. Father, help us to understand what that means. That we are children of the King of the universe. Father, we pray that we hold our heads high, not in pride, but in worship, as we look to you, and we say thank you, and we praise you for what you have given us. Thank you for the resources you give us for each day and each week, and Father, whatever we face, and we know that some of us are facing uh, real challenges in our lives. And Father, we pray that you would give us the resource keep our, to help us keep our eyes on you, to help us to realize that we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. That's our position. That's where we will be one day. And because of that, Father, you've given us these resources, and we don't have to be anxious or worried. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name.